Today's episode is a magnificent start of a series. It's on this book, The Hidden Spring by Mark Soames, the journey to the source of consciousness. And we'll bring you multiple parts to bring you through that. It's an incredible book and really mind opening mind expanding, as is the goal of the show. Our guest is one of the boldest thinkers in neuroscience. He's a pioneer of dreaming a heretic of consciousness, the man who discovered the brain mechanism for dreaming. It is a pleasure to welcome the author of this magnificent book, The Hidden Spring, A Journey to the Source of Consciousness, Mark Soames. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Aidan. Glad to be here. It's great to have such an innovator in his field on the show, Mark. Uh, I'm absolutely fascinated by the book and I'm very grateful for your time because you've committed a few hours to us over a few days to really, from, from my perspective, so let, let the knowledge seep in because <laughs> there's so much, as I said, a lifetime's worth of work in this book. But I, I thought we'd start with where it started for you because as a child, a peculiar question occurred to you you thought, how do we picture the world as it existed before consciousness evolved? I thought that would be a wonderful way to set it up for our audience. I, I think we underestimate children. Uh, the, the, the questions that they ponder uh, are, are profound ones. Um, and, you know, as we all, as we enter the world and understand the world, um, these questions arise. And uh, because we are children, uh, they arise in an entirely fresh fashion. You know, you don't, you haven't yet learned what questions you're supposed to be asking, uh, and still less uh, do you know what the answers are that you're supposed to give to those questions. So uh, I, like many other children, I, I'm sure, you know, thought about these sorts of things and um, tried to try to understand what the difference was between the, the world as we perceive it and the world itself. You know, it, may, it made a, a, a kind of obvious sense to me that I'm perceiving the world through my eyes. And so my consciousness is how my eyes and brain, I don't even know if I thought about it in terms of the brain, but I realized that my picture of the world is mine. You know, it's something my consciousness belongs to me uh, and I am not inside of anybody else's consciousness. So, you know, presumably they have their own version um, of, of what I'm perceiving. But this this one that I'm perceiving must be different from the actual world itself. Um, and, and then, you know, I went backwards from that to try to imagine at that stage, I didn't think that uh, simpler creatures were conscious. I, I, I just assumed only we human beings were conscious. Um, not, not that I really thought about that, but I assumed there must be a time before there were human beings, and therefore before there was consciousness. And then I was trying to picture uh, what what would that world look like, and, and and it was a real conundrum, obviously, because it's an impossible task. How can you picture a world before picturing things was possible? Um, and I had a kind of the, the conclusion that I came to was something like this, that the, the, the world itself must be made up of numbers or, or some, sort of, some sort of abstract system of, of computations or forces and energies. Uh, I, I pictured that as being uh, in, in black and white. Um, and, I, and I imagined my consciousness was a sort of a bubble. And, out, and beyond that bubble, uh, so the bubble, the surface of the bubble is the way that I'm representing the world. But beyond that bubble was the sort of black and white, entirely abstract, uh, mathematical uh, world. And, you know, because it's an impossible task, of course, uh, that itself was, 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 was not a solution to it. But I, you know, I, 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 I remember it vividly. And it obviously was the beginning of the path uh, that led me to writing this book, which, as you say, is the sort of culmination of, of, my, of my life's work in this area. As the book is, it's part biographical and full of scar tissue of experience working in Soweto in, you know, not so pleasant experiences, 
but also in more glamorous experiences and showing actually what apartheid was like back at the time when you were studying as well. But these formative experiences had a dramatic effect on you in your childhood. And I'm sorry to hear about what happened to your brother Lee, because that had a major consequence on you as well that had a major impact and really sent you on this path to understand about the brain as well. Well, first of all, about the autobiographical aspect, um, I very deliberately uh, uh, set about writing the book in that style, uh, because it flows so naturally from from what we've just been talking about that, that uh, our, our consciousness um, is subjective. Uh, and the subjective perspective that I've brought uh, to trying to grapple with these things first in a childish, amateurish way, uh, and then gradually, as I became better educated, you know, in a in a in a in a more rigorous scientific way, um, it is nevertheless uh, a personal quest, and and it's and it's it's from a particular point of view. So I thought that with this subject matter, it's particularly apt. To, to bring in this, the experiential uh, subjective uh, aspects of that of that scientific journey. But now, um, as regards my brother, um, we started with uh, this, you and I did this discussion. We started with uh, that image uh, that I that I, I think it was in the preface to my book uh, wh where I mentioned this this um, childhood um, uh, mystery. Uh, pondering you know what what is the world itself as opposed to our perception of it um the, the i said i think that children do uh ponder questions like this uh quite generally but in my own case uh it it it, it occurred that those thoughts uh occurred uh, in the wake of um, my brother's accident uh, for for those listeners who don't know what we're talking about um, my brother clambered onto the roof of a of a clubhouse, um, a yacht yachting clubhouse, um, which was, uh, I think, stupidly designed. This clubhouse because it had a sloping roof, uh, and it was and it was built on the on the on a on, on sloping ground, sloping in the other direction uh, toward the water where the, where the where the yachts were. So you could climb onto the roof at the back of the building. And then clamber up it, um, and at the other end, uh, you're facing the water. That is, uh, th there's a there's a steep drop down to the uh, paving below, and so my brother climbed up there with a couple of friends of his, and he tripped um, and fell off the you know the the the, the high part uh, and down onto the paving below. Uh, and he cracked. Uh, he, well, he not just cracked. He smashed his skull um, and sustained a, a brain injury, um, uh, including a, a cerebral hemorrhage. Which um, you know, it's just a matter of luck. If, if a hemorrhage grows too quickly inside of the cranium, uh, it's a it's a life uh, and death situation because uh, you have to remove it immediately. And um, Obviously, where we were located at a yachting club, you know, there's no way that that can be done there and then. But worse than that, we lived in a very small village. So um, even if he could have been taken to the local hospital in time, they, they, that hospital wouldn't have had the expertise. He had to be flown to Cape Town, which is where I live now. And um, so it's just a matter of, of good luck that the, 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 the hemorrhage didn't continue to expand. Um, and so uh, he was he was saved. Um, the, the they managed the the thing conservatively. Uh, uh, there was no need uh, to drain the hemorrhage because because it wasn't uh, continuing to expand. And um, they 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 just uh, stabilized him. He regained consciousness um, uh, once he got to Cape Town. A few days later, he regained consciousness, and. Um, then uh, the only treatment that they gave him was, uh, if treatment is the word for it, was they they plonked a helmet on his head uh, because his skull had been broken um, and uh, was therefore uh, vulnerable, and then sent him back home. And so um, I had the deeply disturbing, uncanny experience of my brother returning 
looking exactly the same, apart from this silly helmet. Um, but he was not the same person. I mean, literally not the same person. Um, he, he was my older brother. I, I didn't mention that. He was two years older than me. I was, I was four. Uh, I was four going on five. Um, and, uh, one of the uh, first uh, sort of disturbing and distressing things that I realized was that he, 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 he many of his developmental milestones, you know, my bigger brother, uh, that there were, there were developmental milestones that he lost, like, for example, reliable bladder and bowel control. And that just illustrates very um, crudely the fact that he was now, in a manner of speaking, my little brother. You know, he, there, there were things I could do that he couldn't do. And, uh, you know, it's pretty obvious why to us now. But, uh, you know, as a four-year-old kid, it's just, it's just completely uh, 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 in incomprehensible. Uh, how, how can it be that I've overtaken him? How can it be that he's gone backwards? Uh, and, but more than that, you know, he just wasn't the same person in the sense of his personality. He, he had a different personality. So you know, imagine the the experience uh, as 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 a as a little child, you know, just thinking. But who is this guy? You know, he looks like Lee, but he isn't Lee. Where's Where's the other Lee? And how can you become a different person? Um, again, just to illustrate what sort of thing I'm talking about, we um, we we used to play together. Uh, the the town we lived in was a diamond mining town. Um, in um in a in a, a country neighboring South Africa, which at that time was occupied by South Africa illegally, I might say. Um, and it, it was it was a diamond mining town where the diamonds were what are called alluvial. That is to say that you don't have to dig uh, deep uh, holes uh, into the rocks. Uh, they just the diamonds are just lying in the sand in the topsoil. Um, so we used to play my father was a, a senior person. Uh, in that company, and uh, so he took us as kids you know, to go and see these open cast mines. So my brother and I used to we had little toy um, uh, earth moving machines, and you know we would mine in our garden, uh, and it was you know wonderfully complicated games, you know where where we would be removing the the, the diamonds, trying to create the same sort of scenario as we'd seen uh, with our father. And um, this, this I remember very, very distinctly. That we, we, I suggested to my brother that let's go and play our mining game, and we went out into the garden. And I, I realized that the game had changed completely. And for him, the game now just meant let's dig holes. You know, it was just digging holes in the sand, you know, like a, like a toddler would do, playing in a sandpit. And all of the symbolic and imaginative. Uh, aspects of the game were just lost on him, um, you know, and so on. That was the sort of thing that happened. Um, and so that, uh, and it was explained, you know, that that this, had, it, it was explained that he'd, he'd injured his brain. So I knew that this had something to do with his brain. Uh, I remember also looking at my parents' encyclopedia. We had an encyclopedia Britannica uh, and, and uh, it had these, um, there was a there was one sh a sh a sheet uh, which showed this the body uh, the external anatomy of the body and then you turned that over and the next sheet showed the the the, the musculature and then you turned that over and then the next one you know showed the the skeleton uh, and then the next one showed the soft tissues you know the the internal organs uh, and and I remember look, looking at the brain in this in this uh, encyclopedia. And realizing that this part of my brother's body, you know, had been damaged, and somehow that turned him into a different person. Um, and you can you can well imagine how from there uh, the path leads directly to what I later chose to study, uh, which was not only the brain uh, but the 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 psychological functions of the brain. So, so I trained uh, in the in the field called neuropsychology. Um, it's not that I decided at age five, you know, I'm going to become a neuropsychologist, but it must somehow have have led um, directly uh, down that path.
In fact, I'll tell you another thing. Since we have so much time, I'll I'll give you the long version. Um, the, you know, my brother struggled enormously at school uh, in consequence of his injury. In fact, that year uh, of the injury, he failed that year. He had to repeat it. Um, and uh, and I should also add as an aside, there was it was a sort of a taboo subject in, in my family. Um, my, we didn't talk openly about what had happened and its consequences. And, you know, it, it was just this horrible thing. Uh, so my brother would, would, you know, would always do badly at school and I would do well. Um, and normally you would be, uh, your parents would be pleased, you know, that they, that their, their child is doing well at school and coming home with good marks. But in my family, it was fraught that that fact, you know, that I was doing well wasn't something to be celebrated. And it was something to be sort of hidden. You know, you, you, you mustn't you mustn't draw attention to it. And, um, you know, I gradually um, began to feel guilty myself, you know, about doing well. And I just didn't know how to deal with it. I, I, I didn't know what how, how are you supposed to manage this uh, because I wanted to do well you know I, I was I was a keen little student and I was you know uh, enjoying school uh, or at least enjoying the intellectual aspects of school um, so I think that uh, by choosing uh, the the field that I did uh, I think that there was a sort of a compromise again none of this was was deliberate uh, and and conscious but but when I look back on it, I think that it was my choice of profession was a compromise between, on the one hand, my guilt uh, about my brother, and on the other hand, my ambition, which nevertheless remained. You know, I was I wanted to do well, uh, but but I but it was I felt bad uh, about doing well, and I think that the idea was the unconscious notion that I that that I that I think drove me in that direction was that this is one field in which I can do well. Because it helps people like my brother, you know. So in this way, I would simultaneously be doing well for myself, but I would also be doing something which was not um, uh, disregarding uh, my my brother's uh, 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 difficulties and and, uh, uh, and and possibly even being able to help people like him. So I think that's one of the reasons why I not one of the reasons. I think it's the reason why. I also didn't want to just be a scientist. You know, I, I wanted to be a clinician. I wanted to do clinical work. Um, right from the beginning, uh, I, I, uh, as I entered the field, I, I knew I wasn't only going to do research. I, I, was, I, I, I wanted to work with patients. It makes sense, Mark, when you read it, when, when you've read the book and then you hear your story, because I, I, my mental model is is pulling parts from later in the book back, you know, you talk about early fears, for example, how fears are instilled in childhood, for example, how imagination as well imaginations, almost like a virtual practice in the mind. So you don't have to do it in real life as a child. And then the importance of play, all these things are hopefully we'll have time to cover later on. But they, they were all part of that story as well. And how, again, you're constantly learning subconsciously and, and as you tell us in the book, feelings are there for error correction, they're to make us do better, etc. So these are all parts that th this is why this story I think is so important to tee us up for later on. But let, let's start to zoom in a little bit into your theories. And I, I mentioned that, for example, you are a pioneer in dreaming and also a heretic in consciousness. And we'll talk about it in a moment, the three departures that you made from common thought at the time, which were breakthroughs eventually, which is what we love on this show as well as those change makers who actually go against the grain. But I thought I'd share a quote to give context to the book. And I'd love you to expand on this, Mark. You say many philosophers and scientists believed and still believe that sentience serves no purpose, no physical purpose. Throughout the book, you persuade us of the plausibility of an alternative interpretation. And you suggest that feelings, as I mentioned, are part of nature, that they are not fundamentally different from other natural phenomena, and that they do something within the causal matrix of things. Consciousness, consciousness you determine, 
and you demonstrate is about feeling and feeling in turn is about how well or badly we are doing in life almost like a compass to try and figure our way throughout life and you say consciousness exists to help us do better thank you so um listeners might be puzzled by one aspect of what you've said um which is this you know i seem to be using the word uh, as as you quote me there i seem to be using the word consciousness synonymously with feeling and uh, I, I don't think that that's uh, necessarily everybody's starting point. I think that most of us think of consciousness in perceptual terms because our, our consciousness is so dominated, particularly by v visual perception. Um, so I think when, when you use the word consciousness, uh, that's the, thought, the sort of thing that's c conjured up in most people's mind. Oh, this, you know, this, this, this uh, thing I'm seeing now is my consciousness. Uh, or this thing I'm hearing now uh, is my consciousness, uh, perceptual phenomena. Um, but uh, I, I don't believe, for, for all sorts of reasons which we'll have time to unpack in due course, uh, I don't believe that that's the correct starting point. Um, I, I, I think that something as complicated as consciousness, um, if you're going to uh, tackle it scientifically, um, you, you need to, you need to uh, address its most basic elements um, first, and then you build up from there to to the full the fully uh, the full complex um, phenomenology of consciousness. So uh, I won't go into it now, but I'll just uh, say that for reasons that we will have time to unpack, uh, I came to the conclusion that the the most fundamental form of consciousness is feeling, and by feeling uh, I mean things like um being hungry uh or 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 being in pain um or being sleepy uh, or feeling too hot you know the, the uh, those very very rudimentary bodily states uh which alert you to the fact you know that's that's something's the matter something's you know you're heading in the wrong direction um if if you feel pain you know it's, it's, something is injuring you you, you must do something about that, which is withdraw from that stimulus. Um, if you're hungry, you know you need to imbibe uh, some energy supplies, uh, uh, and if you don't, you die. Um, likewise, thirst, likewise, sleepiness, etc. These things uh, they manifestations of bodily needs, um, and uh, bodily needs are rather important things. And uh, this this is there must be some way in which the owner of the body uh, you know it registers its needs and th that's what feelings are I I'm, I'm I'm deliberately focusing now on the most simple forms of feelings of course I'm aware that there are much more uh, elaborated forms of feelings uh, namely what we call emotions and moods and so on but these these simple bodily forms uh, 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 are, are, and I'm not just saying this by um, by uh, logical deduction. Uh, it turns out uh, that there's very good uh, uh, evidence uh, for uh, this conclusion. But let's just take that as as given for now. Um, so, if that's what consciousness in its most fundamental version is, its bodily feelings, um, then you know how can anybody in their right mind, if you'll excuse the pun, how can anybody? Uh, believe that they they don't do anything, you know. The, the in, in fact, uh, if you stop for a moment and reflect on it, everything you do is about feelings. You know, it's the feelings are at the absolute center of your existence. It, they are what motivate you to do everything that you do, and and to avoid what you avoid, and to be attracted to what you're attracted to. You know, all of our decision making, all of our choices. Um, all of our endeavors ultimately are about uh, regulating your feelings and trying to feel better in one or another respect um, and and uh, and trying to avoid feeling bad so um i i think the idea uh, uh, two things i'm emphasizing here one is that the idea that consciousness uh, and and uh, and particularly feelings uh, that they that they don't have any place in the 
in the you know causal matrix of things is just crazy. At the time that I was writing the book, I mean, people say the scientists, even neuroscientists, you know, they, they say it all the time that consciousness doesn't do anything. Um, it's not it's not part of the physical you know uh, uh, universe and has no consequences for it. Um, while I was writing the book, I, I, I just read a, a paper. Uh, it, it, and therefore, I quoted it in the book because it was just the latest version of somebody saying that, uh, in which these colleagues, cognitive neuroscientists, uh, um, uh, tried to explain uh, the place of consciousness in the universe by saying it's a bit like a rainbow. You know, the rainbow uh, naturally uh, happens uh, out of the interaction between uh, water molecules and uh, uh, and and light. Uh, and then there's this refraction of the light, and it produces the rainbow. But the rainbow doesn't do anything. The rainbow just, you know, it's just there. What is what is the purpose and function or uh, causal power of rainbows? Nothing. Uh, that's what they said, and and that's how they see consciousness. So, um, as I am saying, if you just reflect on your own personal uh, experience, it, it's clear that your feelings. Uh, have consequences for what you do. Uh, so how can you, how can you, for a moment, suggest that that, that it's not, it has no causal power, it has no consequences for the physical universe? But the other thing that I'm saying um, is by linking feeling to uh, bodily states, um, which which uh, uh, which you can in the sense that I've just described, that the most basic forms of feelings are. Uh, how you come to know uh, your bodily states, uh, uh, your needs, and, and whether they're being satisfied or not. Um, what could be more physical for us than our bodies? You know, and um, if, if you don't, if you don't uh, have the right amount of uh, water and the right amount of sleep and the right amount of uh, glucose and the the, the 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 right you know the 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 the, the right temperature. Uh, you know, if, if you deviate from the very narrow uh, range of temperature that is viable for you know for us human beings to to remain alive, uh, then it has dramatic consequences, physical consequences. Namely, you die. You know what what could be more physically consequential in biology than you know that the the organism dies? And if feelings are there in order to prevent that from happening, then clearly they're doing something physical. So yeah, I mean, uh, th th that's that's the absolute starting point uh, for me. But I, I really do need to emphasize that it's not it's not biological deduction alone. It is when you start uh, taking apart the brain mechanisms of consciousness, you find that the the most fundamental form uh, of consciousness is indeed feeling, uh, and the the parts of the brain that generate feeling um, are intimately interconnected with the parts of the brain that regulate our bodily states. I love that chapter, you dedicate a whole chapter to feelings. And I'd love to cover that in depth in part two of this episode of this of this series, Mark, as well. I absolutely, I was telling you before we came on air, so many aha moments. Ah, that's why, why fears often happen before we're, you know, in our childhood states, and they're so hard to remove, because it's before the brain is fully formed, all that, all that kind of stuff, so many great moments, play, for example, why do children, why do play always finish in tears for children, <laughs> all those kind of things were, were magnificent to read about. And of course, heavily influenced by your friend and colleague, Yak Prancep as well. Is that, do I say his name right there, Mark? Panksep, yes. Panksep, yark, okay. Yark, Panksep. I thought it was important to share your three departures, Mark, as well, because one of the first departures is is hidden in the title, <laughs> the hidden spring. It's important as well. So I thought we'd establish that as well. The the three departures you made from common thinking at the time, and you've touched on some of them already. So what those three departures are? Uh, the first one, as you say, I've touched on already. Um, it is to um, to uh, depart from the idea that consciousness is fundamentally perceptual, um, which which is the same thing as to say that it's fundamentally cortical, because the part of the brain 
that generates perceptual consciousness is the cortex. Um, and, and when I say perceptual consciousness, let us not lose sight of the fact that thinking, uh, co cognition, conscious cognition, is also uh, derived from perception. The same images uh, that we that we uh, perceive here and now, uh, the the memory traces of those uh, those images uh, are reactivated in our thought processes, and so we have these virtual images, uh, including words. Words too are ultimately derived from perception, from from hearing, and so you know even our inner speech, uh, it's all of it derived from perception. So the, these um, perceptual uh, and and cognitive functions derived from perception. Uh, these phenomena, uh, of course, dominate our consciousness. Um, but for the reasons I said earlier, uh, I, I thought, well, feeling, uh, what about feeling? Um, th th this seems to be, you know, the reason that we uh, re represent the world, that we have perceptions of the world, memories of the world, engage rhetorically with the world, is because that's where all our needs get met. You know, so... Uh, we, we have to do things in the world in order to meet these these bodily needs uh, and the emotional needs that we'll come to. Um, so, but the part of the brain uh, where feelings are generated uh, is not in the cortex. Uh, the, the the part of the brain is that is much more ancient, uh, much more primitive, uh, in, and I say ancient in the evolutionary sense of the word. You know that it the the, the part of the brain that generates feelings, um, we share not only with all other mammals, uh, in other words, it's at least 200 million years old, uh, but we share it with all other vertebrates, at least the basic architecture of the, of the parts of the brain that generate feeling states, these, these uh, things like hunger and thirst and whatnot that I've been talking about. Um, we share with all vertebrates, which means that they're at least 500 and something million years old. You know, so, so, um, I, I, I thought that we should focus on, on that part of the brain and on that form of consciousness. Um, when I say that part of the brain, I'm talking about the upper brain stem. Uh, the cortex is like a, like the petals of a flower. Um, and the, the, the stamen, um, uh, is, you know, is the brain stem. Uh, the, the 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 bottom part of it, the the narrow part of it, um, and uh, the odd thing is that um, we've actually known since the 1950s uh, that uh, the, the 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 upper brain stem, a part of it called the reticular activating system, we've known since the 1950s that all consciousness is contingent upon activation by uh, this 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 reticular activating system, hence its name, reticular activating system. Um, the, the the cortex, uh, which indeed is the 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 seat of perceptual consciousness, um, it is only rendered conscious by the reticular activating system. So the reticular activating system is the source, the the spring, uh, as the title uh, of the book suggests. Uh, this, the, the source of all consciousness, including this perceptual consciousness, uh, is in the upper brain stem. So, you know, you, you, you might wonder, well, why, if that's the case, if we've known that since the 1950s, you know, why, why didn't we all look there uh, from, the, from the beginning, or at least from the 1950s onwards? But that's another story, but this, the, we didn't. Uh, so that's my departure. I said, I, I think we should be looking there. Uh, perhaps I'm over elaborating the point, but at the risk of doing so, uh, uh, I will add one further detail just to make sure that listeners get uh, uh, the 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 point, uh, which is that if you damage uh, two cubic millimeters of the upper brain stem, um, a, a part of the reticular activating system called the periaqueductal gray, uh, if if that is damaged to the extent of the size of a of a match head, you know, two cubic millimeters, tiny, tiny little piece of tissue, uh, you go into a coma. You know, th that's enough to obliterate all consciousness, just two cubic millimeters of damage there. And in the cortex, you can take out two cubic millimeters anywhere you like, you won't even notice it, you know. 
Um, so that's the first departure. It's a it's a shift of emphasis, a shift of focus from perception to affect, perception and cognition to affect, and a shift of focus from the cerebral cortex uh, to the reticular activating system of the brain stem. Now, the second departure um, might uh, I might lose friends uh, and and stop influencing people uh, when I tell them this, but. Well, what can you do? It's the, it's the truth. Um, the second departure is that I returned uh, through the history of my field. Um, I, uh, I, I went back to its origins um, and trying to understand, you know, how did it happen uh, that this, this idea that consciousness doesn't do anything um, and and what is even worse, when I was a student, which was in the nineteen the early nineteen eighties, it wasn't only that consciousness doesn't do anything; it was that you must not speak about it. You know, it's bad science. Um, it, it, you must exclude subjectivity from science. Science is objective, and so anything that's subjective, you know, must be eradicated. How can you have a science of the mind uh, which excludes subjectivity? I mean, what is the mind if not Something subjective. It is. It is fundamentally subjective. So to have a psychology uh, that excludes uh, consciousness is, is is a or feelings uh, is to have a, a psychology that excludes the psyche. I mean, psychology excluding the psyche. Uh, somewhere we took a wrong turn. Um, and uh, so behaviorism, uh, which you mentioned earlier, was 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 uh, dominated. Psychology in the in the middle of the twentieth century, and it still left a long shadow uh, on the neuropsychology that I learned in the in the early eighties. Um, so uh, that that uh, I, I became interested in the history of the field. Where did this crazy notion come from uh, that we that we can't include subjective phenomena in the science of the mind? Um, and uh, went back. Via behaviorism uh, to the early 20th century and the late 19th century. Uh, and in the late 19th century, it turns out that um, introspection and the study of uh, subjective experience uh, was very much at the center of, of psychology, which, which seems natural enough, obviously. Uh, th 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 that's what you should be studying if you're studying the mind. And so that made me. That brought to my awareness uh, the, the 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 field of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis, uh, which was then rubbished by the behaviorists and uh, and thoroughly discredited uh, uh, during the course of the twentieth century, um, for all of its faults, uh, it, it takes as its starting point. Uh, if you want to have a science of the mind, then you wanting to have a science of subjectivity. Uh, and it puts subjective experience slap bang at the center of its conception of the mind and of the methods that it uses, psychoanalysis. The, the method of psychoanalysis called free association, um, it just takes samples of, uh, of the stream of consciousness um, as, its, as its raw data. Um, but even more, uh, so that was that made me interested in psychoanalysis, which let me just make clear what I'm saying. So that's the other departure uh, that I'm a, I'm a, a neuropsychologist uh, and a neuroscientist, um, and I started becoming interested in psychoanalysis and uh, and eventually actually even trained in it. Uh, as I, I, so I'm also a psychoanalyst. My colleagues were appalled. You know, they said it's like a, 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 a one colleague said to me, it's like an astronomer studying astrology. You know, what are you doing? Um, but uh, it, 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 why I did it was because I thought that the neuropsychology uh, of the early 1980s that I was learning, uh, it was just really, it might have might as well have been called neurobehaviorism. You know, the, there was no psychology there. It was, it was all just about behaviors and, 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 and about um, the information processing mechanisms. You know, the, uh, it was all third person kind of abstract description. And 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 questions like you know so okay so that's the memory system that's how that's how it works that's where it is in the brain you know these are its subcomponents and so on but why do you actually experience 
a memory. You know, why, why does remembering feel like something? It's the most remarkable property of the brain, that it feels like something. Uh, it's, it's the only thing in the known universe that has subjective experience. Surely the subjective experiences are doing something. And if you leave them out of account, you won't understand how this organ works. Um, but when you ask your professors, as I did, uh, in the, you know, those days, but what, what about feelings and, and why do, you know, what, what, why, why do we actually have conscious memory? Because we learned there are these declarative memory systems and then there are the non-declarative memory systems and the declarative ones are the ones that you can bring the information up into the buffer of short-term memory and so on uh, as you know, but the, nobody ever spoke about what why why does this buffer exist in the sense that the, the the owner of that brain actually experiences the memory? What does the experiencing do? What is that for? Uh, when I asked questions like that, I was told, "Don't ask questions like that. You know, they're bad for your career. These are not these are not proper scientific questions." So you know that's why I, I, I turned to psychoanalysis as a, a discipline uh, which had. Uh, no qualms about uh, studying experience, trying to understand experience, uh, and and most importantly, uh, have methods uh, for studying experience and a, 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 a conceptual uh, armamentarium, a, a language, a theoretical language for for describing the, the the different aspects of experience and the and the things that underpin it. Um. But even more interesting than that, as I started delving into that field, uh, remember this was all part of the going into the history of 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 how we came to this pass that that, that I was at in the in, in the eighties, where you, you, you know you weren't allowed to ask about about subjectivity. Um, I, I learned while going into that history that Freud was a neuroscientist. I had no idea Freud was a neuroscientist. Um, Freud was a neuroscientist for a long time. You know, he's, he published his first neuroscientific papers in the late 1870s, uh, and the last ones uh, in 1900. So, you know, that's that's 22 years um, of, uh, and he published. If you count all of his publications, uh, including the little ones, uh, he, he published more than 200 titles in 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 uh, in neuroscience. 200 publications. You know? So he was a very serious neuroscientist. And um, so I, I became interested in, in why did he abandon neuroscience? Uh, in, in, you know, because as much as it's um, an obvious thing that you should be studying experience if you're studying the mind, it's equally obvious that you should be studying the brain if you're studying the mind. So why did he let go? You know, And so I, I, read, in, I, I read those early papers and, and uh, uh, and and uh, try to get a sense of uh, how his career veered away from neuroscience toward a, a more or less pure psychology. Um, and uh, I realized uh, it was actually not very complicated. It's just that didn't have the methods. Uh, the, the, these kinds of questions uh, about, you know, how do feelings work, etc. cetera, um, there were no neuroscientific methods whereby you could study them neuroscientifically. So the only empirical science that was possible was using purely psychological methods. And Freud made very clear that this is provisional. You know, one day there'll be progress in neuroscience and then we'll be able to, you know, uh, supplement our psychological observations with neuroscientific ones and we'll understand, you know, how they, how the two things uh, work together, you know, how the, how these subjective states um, um, relate to the physiological uh, and uh, anatomical and, and and chemical things that we know about the brain. So there, there, there it was. I, I thought, well, that's my job. You know, I, I'm I must pick up where Freud left off and uh, finish the job. Uh, and that's uh, uh, the second departure. It's it's going back to the origins of psychoanalysis uh, and and uh, and and building up the neuroscientific side that was that Freud had to had to let go of. Uh, and then try to uh, integrate um, what 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 he had learned about subjectivity, about the feeling, lived life of the mind, uh, link it with with what we with we now have wonderful tools in neuroscience. There's there's, there's ne 
next to nothing about subjective experience that you can't study also from the neuroscientific point of view. So that's the second departure. Mark, before you go into the, the third departure, I, I just one of the observations I wrote down in my notes was, I wonder, because you you speak truth, you're a truth speaker, you call out the emperor's naked. And I thought I wondered to myself, because you're talking about Freud, and Freud always reminds me of Jung, etc. I was like, because I work part time, one of my hats that I wear is executive coach. And I always kind of go wonder what happened in, in your early stages that caused that. And I wondered, was it because of that not speaking about Lee at home, that that you had this burgeoning desire to be able to speak about it and kind of go, it would be better to call it out. It's annoying me that, you know, I wondered, was that in there? And then the other thing that dawned on me, and many of our audience know this is there's a great axiom of innovation, that innovation happens at the intersections of different disciplines, of different ideas of different people from different organizations coming together. And that's where the magic happens. And I really felt that from your work. And then you were also influenced by many change makers like Oliver Sacks, like your friend Eric Kandel, who writes a wonderful recommendation for the book as well. I have one of his books on my on my bookshelf there displayed, especially because he's one of your friends. And of course, Antonio Damasio, who's due on to the show as well. So these wonderful thinkers were all supporting you as well, I felt. I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. Let me just say that I agree with you about um, uh, linking as you just have uh, psychoanalysis with speaking the truth you know that's uh, that that there there are things that we don't want to think about um but they're still there and uh, you know uh, they they have their uh, effects whether you whether you pay attention to them or not in fact if you don't pay attention to them they have their effects despite you um if you do take them into account then at least there's a possibility of being able to uh, of, of uh, t t being able to gain some measure of control over them, um, and and uh, so that that uh, uh, ethic of of uh, speaking about unwelcome things, facing up to them, dealing with them, uh, I, I think you're quite right to link uh, uh, th that aspect of my um, uh, the path that I took uh, also to the the. the a difficult situation in 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 my family the the the, the fact that you know the, the the i remember thinking not when i was very little but thinking somewhere along the line you know, if if we could just talk about lee uh, you know i want to help you know, I, I, I don't want to hurt him uh, you know if we can just discuss it let's come up with a strategy how are we going to deal with this awkward thing uh, but but uh, it was it was just a, a taboo subject um you you speak then about um uh, about these these other figures uh, um and and the interface between fields I, I completely agree um that that's where innovation happens i i, I want to tell you just in case i'm giving the wrong impression i didn't decide i want to be interdisciplinary you know this is where innovation happens uh, it, it, to me it I, I keep on saying this it's just absolutely obvious that you should be doing this you know if, if you're wanting to understand uh, the, the 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 mind you should be studying it first of all from a subjective point of view you, you know that you need to understand where does subjectivity come from and where does it fit in to 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 the causal matrix of things and secondly you need to use all the, the, the neuroscientific tools that you've got and so there you have interdisciplinarity just you know uh, it just uh, just happens um but when i did start doing that um from the from the uh, 19, late 1980s onwards uh, in the 1990s i well in fact it was in the late 1980s i started training i moved to london to train in psychoanalysis and and so and then started integrating the two fields uh, from the 1990s onwards i was like a kid in a toy shop you know, it was just like you couldn't help but make discoveries. You know, every every week. You know, because it was just all so obvious uh, that this links to that, and this links to that, and nobody had tried to do it before. So, you know, you're lucky enough to be the first one there. You just, you, it's just wonderful. Um, so that sense of innovation that you're talking about arising out of interdisciplinar interdisciplinarity, I, 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 I have lived that. I've experienced it, and it's it's thrilling um, to to do so. 
um, the, 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 the people you mentioned, um, Oliver Sacks was the one who came to my uh, aid first. Um, he wrote a book in 1984 called A Leg to Stand On, um, which was an autobiographical account of a, of a, of a rather serious nerve injury uh, that, that he sustained, uh, he himself sustained. Uh, and it was a, a kind of a, uh, th th that was the core uh, 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 of the narrative structure of the book was about his own injury to a nerve in his leg, hence the title, The Leg to Stand On. But then from there, he elaborates and uh, um, and and speaks about the importance of subjective experience and, you know, why one feels pain uh, and, and so on. And, and, and then at one place uh, in his narrative, he makes this remark. He says, neuropsychology is admirable, uh, but it ignores the psyche. You know, neuropsychology is admirable, but it ignores the psyche. And I thought, that's it. You know, this is exactly what I'm experiencing. I'm training in neuropsychology and it ignores the psyche. You know, and this, in other words, the subjective dimension. So I wrote to him and, uh, and said, you know, that's the truest thing I've, 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 I've heard. Uh, in, in, in the few years that I've been trying to uh, come to grips with neuropsychology, it, it, it ignores subjective experience. And uh, he then went on to write um, a couple of years later, um, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, uh, which was this glorious set of case studies, um, all of them uh, being about the experience, the subjective experience of the new, of these neurological patients, and so we we uh, we corresponded uh, 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 through those years, and then eventually uh, established a, a friendship as I started to travel more and got to know him in, in the states, and uh, and in fact uh, he also uh, came across the pond quite often. So we we spent a lot of time together, and he was a great great great. I think that. You know, he was obviously not a serious scientist, uh, Oliver Sacks. He was a storyteller and a, and a writer of case histories and so on. But I think that his work is enormously important for neurology and neuropsychology, precisely because he told the stories of the patient's lives and their experiences of the weird and wonderful things that happen to neurological patients and what they can teach us about what the different parts of the brain that are diseased in them, what they doing from a subjective point of view, what, what, what contribution they make to subjective experience. And this, this, so this is the importance of Sachs. Like many change makers, Mark, as you tell us, he was reviled and often dis disregarded by many of his peers. And it had a dramatic effect on him. I often call that out because it's important to know for change makers in organizations even that when you go against the grain like you have, you get attacked. The status quo does not like it. Uh, one one of his detractors, uh, I told you the name of his book, the, the, his most famous book, the, the the man who mistook his wife for a hat. One of his detractors said that Oliver Sacks is the man who mistook his patience for a literary career. That's <laughs> really nasty. Um, I I I have uh, suffered the consequences of uh, of going off the beaten track. Uh, but I also don't mind that. I, I think that you have to accept that's the price you pay. If you if you're going against the the, the uh, compact majority, you know they, they, they're not going to like it. Uh, if you say, "Hey, no, you're going the wrong way. Let's go this way," you know they 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 they're going to resist. Um, so if you don't have people um, opposing what you're doing, they they're just ignoring you. You know it's. Uh, You've got no hope of influencing the field if they're ignoring you. Uh, if they if they start arguing with you and, and saying nasty things about you, then you know at least uh, you're being you're being noticed, and uh, then you have a, a an argument on your hands, and you know you shouldn't expect otherwise. And then you you know then you engage in that argument. Um, Eric Kandel, uh, the reason that he uh, became uh, so supportive. Was that that he in his youth? Um, I, I never knew this till he told me. He in his youth, um, uh, by which I mean at medical school, uh, he wanted to become a psychoanalyst. Um, and his his girlfriend at the time uh, was the daughter of a famous psychoanalyst, Ernst Chris, 
uh, uh, was uh, the name of the this Viennese emigre uh, in New York, as was Kendall, a, a Viennese emigre of a, of, a, of a different generation. Um, and Ernst Chris said to him, you don't have the right personality to become a psychoanalyst. You should become a research scientist. Um, and that's what prompted Kendall to become a neuroscientist. But he always retained an interest and a great respect for psychoanalysis. I don't know how many people know that. Uh, so, so he was delighted when, when I started to try to draw these um, links between the two fields, trying to integrate the two fields. He said, you know, that's that's what he would have loved to have done. You know, if, if I mean, I'm I'm a generation again younger than him, so um, he was he was thrilled uh, to see that somebody was doing what what he'd always thought should be done. Once we have the tools to do it, um, Antonio Damasio, uh, uh, I became uh, his pal because he was a neuropsychologist and a, a neurologist of great um, respectability. Um, he he'd done very good work uh, on on um, particularly on cortical mechanisms of vision, and it was highly regarded, um, and and uh, uh, trained in fact under the great Norman Geschwind, who was the who was the the leading figure of behavioral neurology and neuropsychology in America. Um, and I'm telling you all of this about his credentials because um, in the mid 1990s. Uh, uh, which is when I was myself, you know, grappling with all of these things. Um, he brought out a book uh, out of the blue. It was called Descartes' Era, um, which which uh, basically argued uh, that that we're 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 missing a trick here. What, 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 why are we only focusing on cognition? You know, what about emotion? Um, and it was a it was a a, a, a brilliant um, uh, uh, plea. Uh, uh, with with reference to to scientific evidence, saying, "Look, this is very important. The emotions are a very important part of how the brain works, and we, we're not going to understand it unless we focus on these things too." And because his credentials were so impeccable, you know, uh, he more or less single handedly brought uh, respectability to the study of feeling uh, in in neurology and and neuropsychology. So so. That's why uh, when I read that book, I, I, I immediately uh, made contact with him, and um, we've we've worked um, t together and and established a friendship uh, ever ever since. Um, but I think we were going to get to the third of my departures. <laughs> Sorry, uh, <so> man. <laughs> no, no, it's I'm, not I'm your too fault. Interested it's in, in... <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it's, it. Let's do it. Yeah. So the third the third departure. And again, um, I think that uh, I'm at risk of, uh, of of people losing all confidence in me when I when I say this. But um, the 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 third departure arises out of another uh, research collaboration uh, and, and friendship that I established um, uh, over the years. Uh, this one in more recent years, uh, I only met him in 2012. Um, a very 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 brilliant. Neuroscientist uh, in London named Carl Friston, and um, Friston is is quite different from the others that we've just mentioned. Uh, he wasn't especially interested in feelings. Um, in fact, he's he's what is called a computational neuroscientist. Uh, he 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 was interested in uh, trying to um, reduce uh, neurophysiological processes to the underlying. Uh, computational mechanisms. What algorithms are are are, are, are uh, driving the, the 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 physiology of the brain? And um, I, I don't want to run too far ahead of myself, but uh, he 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 published a famous paper. And when I say famous, I mean Carl Friston is super famous. He's the most widely cited neuroscientist in the world. Uh, we we measure the influence of a scientist by their H index. Um, and I, I didn't even know it was possible to have a three-figure H index. I've never heard of anyone whose H index was in the hundred. So his is two hundred and forty-eight or something like that. And he's truly, uh, objectively, the most influential neuroscientist alive. Um, and uh, I read a paper of his in, in two thousand and nine uh, in one of the journals of the Royal Society, and the the paper was called uh, "Life as We Know It," uh, and it was about a basic biological mechanism 
uh, which lies at the heart of all living organisms. It's how they stay alive. Uh, it's called homeostasis. Um, and and uh, I mentioned in the beginning of our conversation about the importance of feelings. I said they tell you, you know, wh- how well or badly you're doing in relation to your bodily needs. Um, well, how well or badly you're doing in terms of your bodily needs is regulated by homeostasis. Uh, if you're in your homeostatic range, uh, that means you're meeting your need. Uh, if you're deviating from that range, it means that now there's an increasing demand on your on your body to do something. Um, and as I said in our conversation earlier, uh, how we become aware of that deviation is we feel it. Uh, so so uh, un- unpleasant feelings uh, are how the organism registers its moving away from its homeostatic bounds. And pleasant feelings are how we know we're heading back towards our homeostatic bounds. And um, so Briston's paper, um, the, the one that I just mentioned, um, which, um, oh, sorry, it wasn't 2009, it was 2012. In 2009, he published an, an, a paper uh, about the free energy principle. In 2012, he published this one, uh, which is which is an elaboration of his 2009 uh, paper where where he says that the basic mechanism uh, at work uh, in in the brain uh, is is that we have to minimize something called free energy, which we'll get to in in our conversation in due course. Uh, but but then in this 2012 paper, uh, he links free energy minimization to homeostasis. That base, so this deviation from your homeostatic bounds is increasing free energy. And uh, so I read this paper, in which he reduces. Um, homeostasis to its basic uh, mathematical uh, for, uh, formalisms. You know what he reduces it to a set of equations. That these he wrote a set of equations uh, formalizing how homeostasis works, and that was like a bolt out of the blue to me because I had come to the view that feelings are basically homeostatic, uh, as I just explained. And now, here was a computational a neuroscientist uh, reducing uh, homeostasis to a set of equations. And remember, our starting point it was how do you bring feelings into physical science? Uh, how, w- 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 you know, how, how can we connect feelings with with everything else that we know about the physical universe? And he had just reduced to a set of equations, causal mechanistic equations, uh, the, the, the 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 fundamental biological principle of homeostasis. If feelings are an extended version of homeostasis, then it must be possible to write equations like that uh, about how feelings work. It must be possible to bring, in this most um, concrete way, it must be possible to 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 be able to in, include uh, feelings into a, a physical, mathematical, uh, causal account, uh, 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 just like anything else uh, in, in 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 biology. And so I, I I joined up with him, and we had several meetings from 2012 onwards, uh, and we wrote a joint paper in 2018 uh, uh, called um, "How and Why Consciousness Arises," uh, where where we reduce it uh, to an ex- extended version of of homeostasis, and and therefore an extended version of the equations that he wrote in the 2012 paper. Now now I come to my point. Um, there was a famous physicist. Uh, Richard Feynman, uh, when he died, uh, it was found written on his blackboard. It wasn't quite his dying words, but it, you know, it was one of the last things he wrote on his blackboard. He said, uh, "If I can't create it, I don't understand it." Um, and that uh, it, it's in that spirit uh, that I made my third departure. Uh, I thought, look, if this really, if if Kristen and I really believe. Uh, that these equations describe um, uh, precisely uh, the causal mechanism whereby a feeling is generated in the brain, uh, then we should be able to create a feeling. We should be able to uh, instantiate that very same uh, architecture, the same computational architecture, uh, in in a artificial agent, uh, and we should be able to engender feelings. Uh, we should be able to literally engineer. Uh, a a feeling robot, a robot that 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 is trying to survive, um, and uh, that has uh, has multiple competing needs, like a need for an energy supply and a need to 
not get damaged when it bangs into things and the need to stay within its viable temperature range, not overheat and so on. If that's all that this robot is trying to do, is trying to survive, and it uses this extended form of homeostasis um, that we are claiming uh, is the is the mechanism whereby feelings are generated, then, uh, th- th- then there should be artificial feelings uh, in this artificial version of the same thing. If it's got the same mechanism, if that mechanism really is what generates feeling, then it must be possible. Um, the, there's a gigantic leap that's required here, uh, which is you have to take, you have to, you have to look at this from the robot's point of view. You know, in other words, you have to, you have to grant subjectivity uh, to the, to this agent. And then there are all kinds of philosophical and scientific questions, methodological questions about how you go about demonstrating uh, uh, in a way that that meets the the ordinary requirements of science. But but I think that unless we can do that, um, unless we can actually remember Feynman's comment: if I can't create it, I don't understand it. So what we are trying to do, and have been for about two years now, is exactly that: we are trying to we are trying to uh, 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 engineer uh, a, a, a artificial consciousness, um, and we are not there yet. But we're making bloody good progress, um, and uh, that obviously uh, is uh, it, 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 it's, it, it, that's a gigantic departure. The idea that we might actually be able to engineer uh, a, a simple form of consciousness, and let me emphasize again, it's just simple raw feeling. Uh, and it's an artificial kind of feeling. It's not like yours and mine, um, but 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 that's what we're trying to trying to engineer. Beautiful. <laughs> I'm laughing because my my intention was this would be the introduction for the show we were going to do, and we've done an entire show, which just shows you the depth of knowledge that's in this book. It's it's such a brilliant book, and I I'll have to recalibrate Mark on what episode two and episode three will be perhaps you, you might have time to do some more because there's so much in the book. And you mentioned some of the themes there that we haven't even delved into. But the history is fascinating, you cover it in a fascinating way through the lens of your experience as well, which is really magnificent. And I, I really look forward to sharing part two with our audience for people who want to find out more about your work, Mark, and find out more about your papers, and indeed your books, where can they find you? My first request is that they should read this book uh, because, you know, that really um, it, it, the reason it's a book uh, as opposed to a paper is because the, the same reason why our conversation today has, uh, we've just scratched the surface and we've spent an hour and a quarter doing it. Uh, you know, it's, it's, this is a complicated topic. And um, if you try to reduce it to a few sentences, you, you're not going to be able to convey what, what's, you know, what it's all about. However, Having said that, um, obviously you can't expect everybody to read the whole book. So, so what I would suggest um, is that anyone who wants to get a sort of short version, um, they can just Google my name, Solms, um, and um, hard problem, uh, w- which refers to the hard problem of consciousness. So Solms, hard problem, and then the word frontiers. Um, and it will bring up an open access journal article um, which is entitled um, the 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 hard problem of consciousness and the free energy principle, but they don't need to remember all of that. Just my Solms hard problem frontiers. It'll bring up the article, uh, open access. There it is, and it's a summary um, of uh, of of uh, Friston, what what Friston and I uh, have 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 done in this in this field. Brilliant, Mark. And I'll, I'll share that. I'll, I'll put that link on the YouTube video and any of our channels as well to make sure that people can find that easily. It's been fascinating. It's been a journey, <laughs> as the book is a journey to the source of consciousness. We're only at the very, very start of that journey. We're only actually mapping it out at this point. Author of The Hidden Spring, Mark Soames, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Aidan. Thanks very much. I look forward to part two.